and she ended up getting pregnant right when my dad left. Why so, did your dad leave to do it? So my dad just like started realizing. I think after seeing everything that me and my sisters were going through or about to go through and having to conduct a lot of these things and write a lot of these things, he's starting to realize there's a lot wrong with this. Well, and, especially because he's the, one of the higher-ups kind mm-hmm. of having to do all this research. Uh-huh. So and really... he started, like, seeing a lot wrong with it. And he's like, I don't feel comfortable with this. He's like, I wouldn't feel comfortable with my daughters, like, doing a lot of this. like. Yeah. And so he started, like really doubting everything that he kind of been living for the past 10 or so years oh and uh he, did he ever i know this is probably personal but did he ever like apologize like because he yeah. kind of brought you guys there yeah all, all the time he sent me like a message randomly in the middle of the night the other night he's like i'm so sorry for everything i put oh. you through i'm like dad it's, it's like 2 a.m where you are go to bed <laughs> go to sleep. Stop thinking about it. <laughs> day like it's in the past but the fact that he cares yeah. you know it's a no. big deal he's he actually wrote a book for me and my sister um and it's like a lot of stories about his upbringing and then like his experiences in the AB and things that he learned about being in the AB mm-hmm. and than like poems and stuff and there's like a lot of interesting stuff in there but he he definitely the life shock after living a such an extreme way for so long and then coming into the real world again not having the support of a spouse or anything anymore like i was like pregnant just very her yeah he left right like a month before i had my daughter so so did you leave and then he left Mm-hmm. Okay. Yep. But yeah, he left like a month before I had my daughter. So I was like, I was a new mom. Like, I was also a teen mom. Wow. And so, like, my mom stayed, his other wife stayed. And so it was just him kind of getting to know the world again for wow. the first time. And, so your mom was like, I'm not leaving with you? Uh, so he actually left both of them. Um, but I think a lot of it was my mom not wanting to leave. Like, I just wow. don't think that my mom. Honestly, I don't think my mom will ever leave, and it breaks my heart, but especially because she knows a lot that's wrong with it, and she knows that she's treated differently because of who I am, because of the fact my dad left, Mm -hmm. because she's not, like, at an age where she contributes any value to marriage because she can't have a bunch of kids and whatnot. Right, so she's not even, like, if anything, they see no use or value in her. Exactly, and it... It breaks my heart because it's like, as, as long as she's there, she's never going to experience true love again. Like, she's never going to find somebody that actually, like, genuinely wants to be with her, wants to, like, care about her kids, wants to treat her right. Like, she's never going to get that. And she's never going to have an, any independence either because she's entirely dependent on them yeah. well, that's to get okay. by. But they yeah. treat her like crap, and it breaks my heart. Man, your mom and my mom are very in very similar <laughs> situations, but that's... In a lot of cults too, they they really make so that they the people don't know how to take care of themselves in the yeah. outside world. So then they feel like they have to stay there. Yeah, exactly. Like uh, they were they were trying to pressure my mom because my mom does like massages, and they were trying to tell my mom like you can't massage men, and she's like um, half of my clients are men because. Mm-hmm. They're the ones that are hardest on their bodies, and right, they're the they ones need that need consistent work done. Like you can't tell me like I can't do that that's my income like right. i have no income without that and they're like you can't do it oh my and God. she's like watch me <laughs> like I, yeah, she's still doing it. she's she like i me. need to be able to like provide like you guys keep cutting me off more and more like i need to be able to provide so, like it's interesting to see their frame of it because they're the ones that joined and mm-hmm. then you know but you were like against your will getting into it and then you the whole time you wanted to get out yeah so when you finally left my best friend at the time she was older than me she was 18 19 i think i was 16 and she had already left she lived pretty close by to me and she knew that i was kind of going through some stuff and things were getting worse at home and everything and when i left i called her up i was like i'm leaving and she's like i'm on my way so did you Um, live with your friend for a while yeah so we stayed at her aunt's for like a week or two i think um her aunt was awesome she, she, like that night she was like you look like you need a drink like your parents aren't gonna come hunt me down for this are they i was like no oh, <laughs> she's wow. like here have some wine oh wow um, i remember but, being like oh, the devil's juice <laughs> <laughs> we kind of 
both bounced around for a little bit because it's like we didn't have like a job or anything stable and then at this um, time you were a teen still yeah right? and then she finally was able to get an apartment and we lived there with like four other people like what? in this two bedroom apartment like we had a bunk bed in the living room but, like that's how bad we were trying to make it work but and then how long after did you get pregnant uh like two years after so i still had a while i i didn't end up even needing holding out help until i was like 17. Wow, um, so you were like on your own for a little while. Oh yeah, cuz like I only lived in that apartment till like so I left the AUB in May and then I got kicked out of the apartment in December because the other roommates like voted against me oh. because I was working later down in Manaquin and so I would have to stay down there for several days in order to work and then come back up for the weekend and I'm like she's just not living here so there's no point. I was like I have to stay down there. I don't have a car. Like, yeah, what am I supposed to so do? they kind of like voted me out and then I kind of bounced from place to place after that. I lived in Montana for a little while. Um, wow. And then when I got back, uh, funnily enough, the people that converted, my parents um, had left and <laughs> holding out help. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, holding out help had helped them. And I had never heard of holding out help before, but one of them reached out to me and she's like, I have a feeling. <laughs> that, uh, that I should reach out to you and see how you're doing. And I was like, oh, yeah, I left, like, the group and whatnot. And she's like, oh, I feel, like, responsible because we converted your family. And okay. your <laughs> she's like, so I'm going to introduce you to some people that can help you and, like, okay. introduce me to holding out help. Um, That's good. But, yeah, she felt, like, really responsible. She's like, crap. Yeah. Like, and I ended up leaving, and now, like, you're in this mess. So. Yeah. And meanwhile, do your parents even know what you're going through? Um, I don't think, so my dad, when he first left, like, he tried to help where he could, but I think he was still just trying to figure out how to navigate the real world as mm -hmm. well. Like I said, by the time he left, I was pregnant about to have a kid. Like, wow. <laughs> so I'd already been out for two years. Um, was that scary when you found out you were pregnant? I, can't <laughs> I, I never wanted kids before I found out I was pregnant and then that was like the first thing that I actually fought for that meant something because yeah. it's like when I first left like I didn't know what to do with my life I was like I'm away but what now yeah and like I didn't have like a stable relationship I didn't really have like a solid circle of friends I didn't mm -hmm. have like a good job or anything it's like you had to start so... all over too and in these cults, they don't teach you how to how to see red flags in people, mm -hmm. too. So I feel like a lot of people tend oh, yeah. to go to toxic relationships. Yeah, I went through world. toxic relationships for years. It like, sucks. And I just was never taught anything. I didn't know anything about drugs. I didn't know anything about drinking in moderation. Like, none of that. So. Yeah, and here, that's another thing, too. I feel like um, a lot of us, all, we're just told it's bad, don't do it. We don't, you're not told why. And yeah. so then a lot of people just go ham because they don't know where the line is. Yeah, you know? exactly. It took me years, years to even be able to like have one drink and be like, okay, I'm good. Like, uh, it, yeah, it would just scared. be like, okay, I'm going to drink it till it's gone. And I'm like, yeah, I'm scared <gasps> that I'm going to definitely go through that because I know my family has like addictive personality, mm -hmm. but I've been okay for now. Like, I feel like it, I'm not missing out necessarily, but yeah. So you don't drink? No. Oh, I've wow. taken Good two for you. sips my whole life. Wow. When I was a little kid, I was super curious about it. And then the second time was on accident because I thought it was um, cranberry juice. <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> I'm afraid. You, uh, I mean, I don't blame you because that's like, it does happen to a lot of us is we're just, we don't know where the line is. We yeah. don't know how to moderate things at all. Right. And so, like, it's just scary. Yeah, it, and, it definitely is. Like, I think it's something that definitely takes a lot of conscious awareness now. It's like, self control, too. And yeah. Sometimes I feel like I don't have that. Oh, yeah. I, I'm, I'm very compulsive mm -hmm. in a lot of things I do because I wasn't like, I mean, self discipline is not something that is taught in those things. Like, yeah, you're right. taught to follow, but you're mm -hmm. not taught how to keep yourself in line be right. accountable to yourself and your habits and your actions so that's not true. taught because well they don't want independent individuals they want people who are going to tie in and be robots exactly so, so it's like when you're on your own like how do i how, how do you cope with your own thoughts and your own feelings and right. like because yeah, i know that you know. i have my days where i spiral a little bit and i know that if i would were a person that drinks i would spiral with alcohol <laughs> yeah know? 
I didn't even receive like any like sex education or whatever. Yeah. It was mostly just like, okay, this is how this happens, but with love and with the permission of God and right. like all this non accurate stuff thrown in there. And they don't really yeah. want to teach you a lot about it because especially mm-hmm. when you're not supposed to be having sex anyways right now. Yeah. Well, and they definitely don't want to teach you about con- like consent in the sense that it's like it's your duty to like fulfill your husband's needs, and Ew, so it's I hate like that. so for me like uh, it's. It's hard to talk about, but it needs to be talked about because I know it's happened to plenty of other girls that have left polygamy, but I got taken advantage of sexually in ways that should never have happened, and I let it happen because I didn't understand consent. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand. I was allowed to say no. Right. I was allowed to be like, I am uncomfortable doing right. that. That was not something well, we were taught. And you're not taught that you um, have, like, you as a person have value. You as yeah, a person exactly. have rights. And uh, so I, it was something that was, like, really hard because there was a point where I had nowhere to go. And I was staying with somebody who was originally from the AUB, ironically. Mm. And he took advantage of the fact that I was young and I was vulnerable. He was, like, oh 27. Oh I was uh, 16, 17. Oh. And he took advantage of that. I had no idea that I could say no or anything mm. like that. And he forced he me to do that, things too. that yeah. I was really uncomfortable with. And oh my gosh. I, I didn't realize how much it affected me until me and my husband. We were at some store that like we rarely go to. There's only a couple things that we get from there. So it's a once in a while trip. And I looked over and that guy was there. And yeah. I like almost started hyperventilating, had to get out of there. Like, I felt like I couldn't breathe. And my husband's like, what is wrong with you? And, like, I didn't even talk to him about it for, like, a week because I didn't know how. Like, how do you tell somebody, like, this person did this to me and I let them because I didn't know that I could say no. Right. And it was so... I feel like (laughs) a lot of people actually go through this out in the real world. Yeah. And so it was so difficult to even just, like, own that. And Mm -hmm. I feel like... as it's not your fault. Yeah. Like, people don't realize that. Yeah. People are not taught that. Like, I, I know so many other people, and I can't share their stories because they're not mine to share, but they've gone through similar experiences or worse it's so because true. they weren't educated on those things and educated yeah. on, like, how certain sexual things happen. And yeah. that's how accidental pregnancies happen. Mm-hmm. That's how, like, severe trauma happens. Yeah, well, and severe trauma isn't even in the vocabulary of these cults. Like, no, talk no, about what's trauma? PTSD, none of that. No, no it, oh, that's all in your head. That's not a real thing. Right, exactly. Like, mental illness doesn't exist. One, <laughs> another term that doesn't exist, which I am shocked about, but um, marital rape, that is... Oh, not, yeah. yeah, that's not a thing. I had talks with women who were in the order, and they would say, I just can't wait for him to get married to his second wife, because then he'll stop, he'll leave me alone. Because they don't think that... They don't think they have the right to their body. Yeah, they don't have the right to say oh, no. God. When the husband wants what he wants, he gets what he gets. And so, I mean, this is a good topic. It's, it's such a touchy topic. I, I might have to put, like, a trigger warning ahead of it. Yeah, okay, but, they need a trigger but warning, But I do yeah. think it needs to be said because people... There are people in the cults, too, that do watch. And maybe, whether they like me or not, they should know that they have value and that they Absolutely. have every right to their body. It's so sad. Yeah, it breaks my heart. Because there's, uh, it, there's people that have had some really bad things happen to them when they leave, and some to the point where it's like it's resulted in them feeling like there's no out except suicide yeah. or, or like drugs and whatnot, mm-hmm. and they turn to these things and they don't it's, know what it's else really to do. sad. It's it's heartbreaking, and I don't want people to feel like that's what they have to resort to. Mm-hmm. That's not like end game for them. Therapy. That's yeah, what I always want to go to therapy. Seriously, therapy. And it really does depend to the circle that you're in, too. Yeah. Like the people you're around afterwards. Because your, your, your brain is still kind of mush when you leave a cult. <laughs> like, really? You have to learn everything over. Right. Everything. Break it all down and then rebuild it. And that's, to some people, that's too much work. They'd rather just yeah. stay in the cult. Oh, I wanted to ask about consecration. I don't remember if we talked about this last time we got together. Do you Briefly. Guys consecrate? Yeah, so we do, but I, I don't think it's as extreme as you guys. 10%, oh, right? Yeah, so. so I, have, I have to explain this because I just saw someone's comment today actually asking what the heck 10% is. And I always just assume everyone knows <laughs> because 10% is, in the order at least, we had to sign these 10% forms every year saying that every everything we make 
the order gets to just take 10% of that and it goes to God. But we also had inventory forms that we would write down everything of value, like your car, your house, everything you had was God's, which means everyone who owns a house never really owns it in their name. It's taken, like the deed to the house or the title to your car is taken and put into like the leader or his brother's name or their company. Oh so God. you don't own anything because you have to consecrate all of your incomings and outgoings being the name of the Lord. That's part of the memory oh God. So I guess... Did you guys do some type of 10% form or something? So, we didn't have any forms or anything like that, but it was 10%, same as the LDS church as well, with, like, their tithing. Um, but it wasn't, like, we didn't have to put, like, belongings in anyone's name. However, they would have, like, certain things that, like, people that were higher up, like, if they owned a lot of land or something, they'd be like, oh, like, I'll let you build houses on my land, like... But then it was kind of like, so, for example, like, my mom. My mom's mm-hmm. single. Like, she or like she has no, like, marriageable daughters anymore. Right. <laughs> um, and she's like, all she's got is my little brother. Yeah. So, she, for women like her who either their husband has left or passed away, um, and they don't contribute any real value, but they can still kind of do things, I guess. They will be like, okay, well, I have this house and you can live there, but you're going to go work at the Bishop's storehouse all the time. Mm-hmm. Oh, you're going to do this for this family that needs it on a regular basis. And they'll kind of just like assign them certain things. So okay. it's like, we'll take care of you, but, you have to take care but of you're going to do this, 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 yeah. and this. And if we don't like something you're doing, we're going to take it all away. Yeah. And so they kind of have certain homes set up for certain scenarios. And then, um, like so they're certain taken care of, but at yeah. a price. Yeah, and, I mean, technically, like, if the prophet was just like, hey, I need this house for some reason, or I need this plot of land for something, or I need this vehicle for something, that it's going to go to him right. kind of thing. So Okay, then um, 10%, do you guys, I'm just wondering how that works, and if you're not signing paperwork, do you have a bank that's the church so, bank? Um, my dad, I have to ask my dad about it, because my dad actually used to be the treasurer for the AUB. Like, I don't distinctly remember a bank, however... Everyone would pay 10% of their income uh, every month. Okay. So it was like um, a monthly thing. Okay. Yeah. That's so different. Because like for me, it was like you turn in $30 at the bank. So like if I were to find $30 on the ground, I would have to go to the bank, the order bank, say, here's my $30, take your 10%, and then I'm going to go spend the rest. So they would take the $30, they'd take their 10% and give it back to me. So like every piece of money you have, you have, they had to. That's through. so crazy. Yeah. we. It wasn't that extreme, but like I do remember... Um, there's somebody that stole a bunch of money from my parents, um, and it happened to be all their tithing money, oh. um, cause they would pay it like three to six months at a time or something like that. Whoa, just kind of get ahead. Chunk of money. So that's a big chunk of money. Yeah. And they stole it all. And I remember my parents freaking out cause they, that put them behind mm-hmm. and then they couldn't pay their tithing on time. Oh my gosh. Like God is going to be mad at you. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We, we didn't have like forms or anything crazy like that. Um. You did have to, in order to go to, like, youth events and certain things, you did have to have a recommend, like a youth recommend. It's basically like a little slip of paper, basically saying you're worthy enough to go. Um, In order to get in the temple, you had to have a temple recommend. Mm -hmm. And then to go to youth events, you had to have a youth recommend. And so the youth events were probably the only thing that made being in the AUB bearable. Um, Like, there, there were dances and stuff, which were, like, they were, they were fun as long as you weren't expected to dance with any older guys. Because if they asked you, you, you were going to say yes, or you were going to get a hard time about it and be, like, guilted for it. Did you have to dance with married men then? Oh, yeah, all the time. Um, Oh, I hate that. I I remember a few times, like, I didn't know they were married until they started talking about their honeymoon trip that they just went Mm -hmm. on. And I was like, what? But like, you can't just stop dancing. Yeah. You can't say no. They're going to give you hell if you do. Exactly. Um, so I wasn't huge on the dances, um, but I did like the youth trips. Uh, so Trek, um, Trek was like, so basically it's supposed to be the spiritual experience. And it's basically like Mormon LARPing. Um, so you know what LARPing is, right? So. so it's like when you dress up like in like middle medieval costumes and you like go out into the woods and like 
act like you're fighting these dragons and demons oh and all my that God. stuff. Um, so but you guys dressed up as like what? You dress up as pioneers, right? Like you're not allowed to bring any normal clothing um, wow. or any technology or anything. And um, you get to bring like a certain amount, like it has to weigh like less than five pounds or something crazy like that. Um, and when you get there, they raid your stuff, make sure you don't have any technology or any modern clothing or anything like that. And then you basically go out <laughs> into the desert and pull these freaking heavy hand carts with everybody's belongings on them, including food supplies and everything like that. Um, and you're pulling them for miles and miles and miles in the desert, in the heat, in the middle of summer, wearing a huge heavy pioneer dress. Yeah. You guys got it easy because they're allowed to wear like coarse like slacks right. and like billowy shirts and so we're over there and we had to wear like layers. Oh like we had God. to wear like pinafores and totally. like and then your everything right? or whatever your underwear. Yeah. Is. And so yeah, we'd pull these hand carts for miles. What was the and, point of that? Just to go back uh, and it's, su it's supposed to be reenacting um part of like uh so when like the Mormons came to Utah, there was a point so there was a point I think it was in like Wyoming or Colorado or something, where like all the husbands had to go off to war or something like that. I don't know what it is. Uh, Mormon history is so weird and incorrect. <laughs> like there's no evidence of half of right. it. But um, all the all the men were gone. Okay, and so all the women are forced to pull these hand carts by themselves up this really steep hill, and it, all the men get to go to the top of the hill and watch. Okay, oh this is the worst gosh. part of it. Is we're all exhausted. We're all overheating and like humiliated. Oh my god. <laughs> And we're in heavy dresses that weigh like 10, 20 pounds while the men are in pants and a shirt. Um, and we have to pull these hand carts that weigh like upwards of like 100 pounds up these hills. Oh this gosh. steep hill too. It's yeah. like this. And the men are sitting there watching. It's supposed to be this beautiful spiritual experience. Wasn't but this, <laughs> this is the thing with cults that I find really funny. Is there something called like, um, I can't remember the exact term for it, but it's exhausted spiritualism or something like that where they basically push you to the point of like mental emotional and physical exhaustion and then throw an experience in so it feels like when you break down oh. that you're so overwhelmed by the spirit okay yeah and so that's basically what that Wait, what? is so, every and so everyone's like at the point of exhaustion uh, mentally emotionally physically and they get to the top of this hill and they break down, they're crying and they're like, oh, it's so beautiful. I can feel the spirit so strongly. No, you can't. What you're feeling is dehydration and heat stress. Yeah. Like, wow. But um, that's something that happens a lot in cults. Like when you see like, um, like certain things where they're like crying, like breaking down, crying and like convulsing. Mm -hmm. Like, it's because they've been like pushed to that yeah, point yeah. and then they're convinced that it's a spiritual event get you to reenact this so you live out the spiritual moment so you're like oh the pioneers went through so much which they did like yeah. okay like trekking through oh, the desert well, like we don't it's need a lot. To do that. <laughs> yeah exactly it's pointless there's no purpose to it um do they still do that yeah every year wow yeah i would love to just go watch the mountain <laughs> i know i want to take a road trip out there one of these days and just be like what's up guys you like to get in this nice car with some water with some ac yeah but at the same time like um, i miss the community of that stuff. Like, yeah. we did paintballing. I had lots of Yeah, see, animals. and there was a lot of stuff like that that we got to do. Like, um, like my favorite was the Wyoming Youth Retreat. So we go on this cattle drive, and, <laughs> yeah, it sounds... You guys really got into yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> we really got into it. We were taught, like, how to shoot horses, like, oh, how to lasso wow. stuff, like, all this crazy stuff like i mean That's at least i world. know how to shoe a horse now right. i don't that own any but the <laughs> yeah um wow. but then we'd have like this like shindig dance thing like in in the middle of nowhere like playing a bunch of like country music or whatever and it was really fun but like it was also very it, it was a great opportunity to single people out and make everyone aware of certain issues like the last one I went on I was like at this point I knew I was planning on leaving like I cut off all my hair like I had a pixie cut I was like 
that done. I remember everybody was like signing stuff, like because it's like no, Wait, the day is, we're gonna. Is hair leave. a big deal? Like, are you not allowed to cut your hair? Uh, oh, it's your like beauty and your value. Like, oh, okay, yeah. so that's why it's a big deal. Like, you cut your hair, like, how yeah. Would she be um, like? and so everyone's like signing everyone's books and stuff, like, oh, I miss you. Um, actually, a couple people that were on that retreat with me were uh, Cody Brown's kids. No, I, I've way. still got like a pamphlet that they're like, "Love you, Leah. Like, miss you." Wow. <laughs> then on the trek, then everyone signs like it's like a yearbook that they're signing. No, <laughs> so usually it's like you get like an itinerary, <laughs> oh. and it's got like the words to the hymns and stuff in there, and who's gonna be saying the prayer, and who's gonna oh. be bearing their testimony and all this stuff, and everyone just kind of signs those. So then, at this time when you would cut your hair, did they all sign sign it being? Oh, to you, oh that's that's what I was I gonna talk about. So, like, no, <laughs> so everyone was signing these books and so somebody had taken off with my book and I couldn't find it. I was like, crap, no, I don't have anything for anyone to sign. And my friend thought it'd be funny to sign me, and everybody started signing me, oh, and they got real max. They're just like, that's inappropriate. Like it looks it's like, like yeah, it looks like oh. tattoos. It, it's like one of the leaders like pulled me in front of everybody and he's just like, This is inappropriate. Like, how could anybody love you like if your body looked like this? Oh my and I was like it obviously didn't Watch me you. find someone yeah. to love me when I have tattoos. Yeah. Like, uh, I was going to ask but, what, like, what inspired because I was so scared to get tattoos. I still am. <laughs> oh, that was like one of the first things I did when I left. Wow. <laughs> I was like, that was my first one. That was the day I realized that I was going to leave. Um, really? Yeah, so I had a friend. Wow. So I had a friend that uh, committed suicide and he had like so how we were talking about the extremist like christians and like the ones that can get like really controlling and yeah. you know, like crazy as well we take it to the next level his parents were like that and mm. it like severely affected him because he had schizophrenia and his parents didn't believe in any mental illness at all and oh so gosh. they would like do these like crazy things like lock him in a closet ah. and stuff and like flick the lights on up do do that to someone with schizophrenia. That just makes it worse. Like, like someone with normal um, nothing. And yeah, and so person. and he, like I think he had epilepsy as well. So the flickering lights like made Triggers. him like seizures oh and gosh. stuff. And then they beat the crap out of him because they thought the seizures were a sign of like demons De and oh stuff. And he ended up killing himself. Um, and That's That's so fun. like the day I found out he killed himself, I was like, I'm leaving. I, I don't. That was like the spell. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, I can't do this anymore. And like, I don't want that to be my life. Like, I know, mm -hmm. like, it's not the same group, but like, and, like, same the thing. extremist religion, like, yeah. that cannot be my life because right. uh, otherwise I'm going to end the same way. So that was my yeah. first tattoo. Wow. <laughs> I never knew that. That's cool. Yeah. So. so you left, got a tattoo. And then do you think that, um, I don't know, this is such like a, I think about this all the time. I don't have kids, but do you think you'll raise your kids? being like religion is optional you don't have to be so i one thing that i always like appreciated about my dad is that uh he always taught me like even though he didn't tell me directly like you could be any other religion or whatnot he, he always taught me if you're ever going to commit to religion make sure you understand it and yeah. know what you're getting yourself into make sure you can back up what you're being told mm -hmm. and because like my my dad's parents are catholic in church mm -hmm. of england my dad converted from being catholic to lds and then converted to polygamy obviously mm -hmm. and then left and is now atheist no um, <laughs> yeah and so he's been through multiple religions a lot of people um, end up just becoming atheists a lot of yeah. people think i'm atheist because I, I don't go to church i don't believe that you have to be a part of a church to be a good person yeah so. see and i'm i'm not atheist but i still have very mixed feelings on god and religion in general mm -hmm. i don't believe in organized religion yeah i i don't because although they preach like community and stuff like that it is a gateway drug to condemnation and guilt. and guilt and like uh, power trips and stuff like that. Like it, it's just yeah. The community part of it is nice if it didn't mm -hmm. so quickly turn into something toxic. Right. And so I, I have very mixed feelings on religion, but yeah. um, well, you have good reason to. Right? Yeah. So it's like my like my husband's Christian. Like he doesn't advertise it. Like yeah. he because he believes his relationship with God is private. It's between him and God, right. and I love that. Mm -hmm. I never heard that in my life. I was like, what? You, you don't have that? to advertise your religion. Like 
you don't have to pray in front of people. What? Yeah. Like, and he's just like, I don't owe anybody but God an explanation. That's true. And he's just like, it is only God's right to judge me. And that was like the weirdest revelation for me. I was like, what? It's so that's, weird. Huh? You that's so healthy. Like, like can religion can be healthy. What? Yeah. And so I, I, Come That's to, good though that yeah. you found someone that So I've come to you. better terms with the idea of God, uh, not quite, I'm still not quite sure. Like, I have never felt secure in knowing, like, God is there, God is watching. Like, I cannot confidently say, I know there's a God. I can't. Because I've never felt his presence. I've never felt moved by him. I've never seen anything that I'm like, I know there's a God. Mm -hmm. And I don't have the faith yeah, to be just, able to confidently say it because of everything mm -hmm. I've gone through. Um, You're just being honest with yeah. yourself, too. Well, it's like I, my whole life was manipulated to think that I was seeing things or, mm -hmm. like, feeling things because that it was God that weren't yeah. there. So it's like, how can I trust anything yeah. else right it now? It kind of like, sucks, too, because, like, you kind of, this is how I feel. Like, I don't know what kind of a person I would have been if I would have never been in this type of cult. Would I have some experiences where yeah. I really do have a connection with God? What are my beliefs? I'm <laughs> yeah. still, like, when we were talking about how you have to break down your beliefs and build them again, I feel like I've done that, like, at least ten times since yeah. I left. Like, do I've I do this? Nope. This? Yeah. Nope. I've gone to multiple churches just trying to see if that's something that, like, I was missing. Mm -hmm. I have prayed a million different kinds of ways. I have... Like, I mean, I own a Bible. Like, I don't believe in the Book of Mormon anymore. Right. Like, I thought I mean, the whole world believed in Joseph Smith. Me too. Like, the realization of, like, realizing all this stuff, like, wasn't the whole world. It was just this one church. Yeah. I was, like, because the church is your whole world. Yeah. When I left, though, too, when I, I met this person that was Christian, and they did not know who Joseph Smith was. And I was like, how do you not know that and now i'm like i envy people who uh, have no yeah. idea but yeah i uh like i own a bible and stuff and it's like my daughter owns a bible like i'll read the bible with her because i think there's some good like moral things in there mm -hmm. good lessons that can be learned and stuff like that and she's very interested in religion um but i'm not raising her to believe that she has to commit to a religion mm -hmm. um or be baptized into a religion or follow a religion necessarily. I'm raising her to be a good person mm -hmm. and be educated on religion. That's good. And she can make her own decision when she's older. But in the meantime, she's going to learn everything about that religion, how it operates, what comes with it. And so she knows what she's getting into. Right. And like, That's really smart. I'm lucky to have you as a mama. And it sucks because, like, I was telling Chanel this too, like, some of the greatest people I've ever met, like you, have had the, like, lifetime of a story to tell. So it sucks that you had to go through all this, right? Like, it, it sucks all that editing time you're going to have to spend on this. I know. I'm sorry. sorry. It's probably going to be a part one and part two. I, have, I think I had one more question. Let's see. How were you treated by the members after you left? Ooh. Um, so it was kind of... I think a lot of people didn't take it seriously at first. I kind of just thought, like, oh, it's a phase. Oh, she's just wanting to be able to do what she wants for a little while, and then she'll feel like guilt and remorse and want to come back and be rebaptized, be wiped clean, and all this stuff. Um, <laughs> like, nope, I got the tattoo. Right. <laughs> um, but, uh, like, yeah, a lot of people didn't take me seriously at first. So some people were, like, still trying to help me and, like, be supportive in a weird way while being like, you know, like, you probably really benefit from coming to church with us. Or, like, yeah, I can help you, but would you mind, like, coming with me? like to young women's or something so they were like trying to like put me in positions where like i'd be spiritually like awoken again or something like that they thought they had um, that responsibility to bring you back and then once it became very clear that i was so uninterested in coming back a lot of people started not only like shunning me but like my kids aren't allowed to hang out with you anymore or um, an entire town tried to get a restraining order from me. An oh entire gosh. polygamous town tried to get a restraining order on me because one of their sons was dating me. I want to say dating, like, we dated for, like, two weeks. I barely knew the kid. And, like, we liked each other, but, like, I very soon realized he was a severe drug addict. Um, 
and found out why it's because his dad would beat him senseless and oh so he was doing drugs to numb it but, but, they all wanted but his dad was a, like not a council member but he was like a higher priesthood holder so he was well respected nobody believed him mm-hmm. and he found out that his son was dating me beat the crap out of his son and then mm-hmm. t- had like a meeting with the town and all the like priesthood holders and stuff and they decided that they needed to get me out of the town but since I was working for someone there they're like well we can't just like kick her out we have to make sure she can't like Come even back. be on the property so they since mm-hmm. there was several different properties on they're like well if we all get a restraining order against her separately that covers basically the entire perimeter of the town and so all these people try to file a restraining order on me but they had no cause like mm-hmm. no just cause and so um like i was notified that like people were trying to file a restraining order against oh me and i was like um for what and they're just like well i don't know <laughs> and so like me and the kid ended up breaking up and he went to rehab i think and i don't think anyone's really heard from him much since wow. but yeah like we dated for like two weeks and i was like yeah no this is not healthy mm-hmm. and, it's not healthy for him too, yeah they're hurting him you don't you don't have control over it. yeah but you know, like um i hadn't had enough experience in the real world to know how to handle somebody on drugs i didn't even know he was on drugs until years later i was like that's what that was. That makes sense. That, that means. Uh, Basically, yeah. you were cast out. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. Like, it sounds like medieval literally. time. Like, get it out of here. Yeah. Well, and when I, because I moved up to Montana and I lived with somebody who lived in the polygamous town up there. And, like, the worst part was, is so the girl I was living with, I was living with her and her family. They thought I was just a friend. I was not just a friend. Like we were dating, her, her parents didn't know about oh, it. Wow. So we were still in the same room and everything. Like they had. Like, no oh, they're idea. just friends. Um, and then like we kind of like agreed, like probably shouldn't date because this is like to get and kind of risky, but we'll stay friends and stuff. Um, but when I was living up there, of course, my dad's second wife's parents lived there, and mm-hmm. so like the whole community, like. They were well aware of who I was and who my family was. And so it's like I'd be walking around or something. And they'd just be like, oh, my gosh, like, don't don't go talk to her. Like, mm-hmm. stay away from her kind of so thing. Just outcast. Yeah. yeah. Um, Which was fine by me because I was in the middle of nowhere. So it's not like that. You probably expected anyway. that that was yeah. going to happen. Yeah. yeah. I just, I, I remember I hung out with a bunch of other people that had gotten kicked out or had left and we just go up the mountain and get drunk. Oh, wow. Um, but, yeah, it, like, now, I think, because um, my mom, like, she performed at the church one time and really wanted me to come see it. She worked for months on this performance. And I was like, I'm going to get kicked out. Like, I'm telling you, I'm going to get kicked out. She's like, don't get kicked out. It's like, I'm going to get kicked out. Um I sat down, and the second I sat down, two ushers, they have ushers, my wow. two ushers come up to me, and they're like, you need to come with us. I was like, excuse me, no, I don't. Oh, and that. they're just like, um, no, you're being disrupted. I was like, how? They're like, you're dressed inappropriately. I'm like, my knees are covered, my shoulders are covered, like, my cleavage is covered, like, how am I dressed inappropriately? They're like, well, you're very curvaceous, and it's a distraction to the married men. Oh, I was like, I'm sorry, God. isn't that their that's problem? Like you problem? I was that like, that's problem. I'm not responsible for the way my body is shaped. Mm-hmm. So I was like, genetics are responsible for yeah. that. I'm like, however, they are responsible for where their eyes go and what's in their pants. So I was yeah. like, I have nothing to do with that. And they're like, no, you need to leave. Oh. We're escorting you out. Oh, and so like, as I'm like as- being escorted out, like one of them like like grabbed me like lower yeah. down like not directly my butt but we were like sliding their hand down and like squeezed a little oh, bit oh my god and i turned around and i was just like oh someone's going to hell and he like got all flustered and he's like i don't know what you're talking about like oh. you're the harlot here I'm like, <laughs> yeah, all well, right man. like well have fun explaining to your wife why you have a erection when you go back in there exactly. like, bye i'm so glad that you left yeah <laughs> really and then my mom like like a couple weeks later she's talking about like oh yeah so and so is just the most respectable guy like i hear he just got married again blah blah blah, oh, blah. 
I'm like, you mean the dude that tried to grab my ass when he was escorting me yeah, out and you know, calling me a harlot? Man. And she's like, oh, he would never. He's such a respectable man. I'm like, um, <sighs> didn't he have a rape charge against, like, his sister when he was, like, 14? Oh, oh but he God. repented. Oh, my gosh. Like, I, <laughs> I can't. I can't. It's so similar stuff in the order, too. Yeah. It's like, no matter what, these men are just so perfect. Yeah, it's so annoying. Hey, I want to get done. We're done talking about all the stuff that makes me mad. And now let's talk about where you are now. I really want to know the story of how you met your husband. Ooh, okay. Um, so I had been like dating this one guy. He was looking for a job and um, a friend of mine worked at a nightclub and he was, he had mentioned they were hiring and I worked security at a different nightclub, but I was like, oh, you should go work over there. Like, mm-hmm. so my buddy got him the job and this and this guy wasn't the greatest. He was kind of a deadbeat, like he wasn't able to keep the job <laughs> and ended up getting fired around the time we broke up. My uh, friend, he was just like, hey, like, I think we're actually trying to hire a female security. You should come on over and like get interviewed and stuff. I was like, okay. And I ended up getting hired. And my husband was actually my boss at the time. No way, this is like Colleen's story. <laughs> right? I was watching that. I was like, oh my God, that's so funny. Um, but he was, yeah, he was my boss at the time. And like, at first we were just like really good friends. Like we got along really well. Like he'd give me a hard time. I'd give him a hard time. Like we just like clicked really well. Um, and then like after a while, like started kind of getting feelings. I was like, no, like weird. It no. gets scary. Like, to be yeah. Workers, right? Um, and he, uh, like one night, like he was just like, I'm pretty sure I'm in love with you. And I it's like, he had been drinking and it was like end of the night. And I was like, you just drunk. Like, I'm, I'm you don't not, mean No, that. we're not going <laughs> to, we're not going to have that conversation. Like, we, like, um, stay there for a couple hours, like, sober up and whatnot. He drives me home, and, like, we just don't say anything the whole ride home. <laughs> and then, like, I get out of the car, and I'm, like, kind of, like, looking at him. And I, like, go to walk away, and I was just like, all right, I love you too. Like, Aww. and, like... That's yeah. So After, you knew you felt the same way. You were just yeah, like, I was just being stubborn. <laughs> That's scary. You can have your heart yeah. really guarded after everything you've been through. Well, and he was the complete opposite of any guy I'd ever dated. He was workaholic, which I only ever dated deadbeats up until that point. So that was a <laughs> like, first. Why you like to work? Yeah, he was literally like worked like 20 hour days like uh (laughs) still works 20 hour days um but yeah workaholic like really well respected by everybody which was so far into me i'm like what everyone likes you like that can't be right like nobody likes is like by everybody but yeah but well respected by everybody um like seemingly normal like no drug issues alcohol abuse issues i was like this is real. <laughs> and, so, how long did you guys date then? Um, he proposed like within a year of us dating. We got married the following year, which we were good, planning on having like a longer engagement, but we we're just like, eh, why not? Like, yeah. we're already living together at this point. Let's like, just get, oh, get it just, done. yeah. <laughs> was like, Ivy the flower girl? Yes, she was. Oh, it was so, so cute. cute. He actually proposed to her first, asking if he could marry her mommy. No yes. way. What did she say? She was just, I think she said, heck yes, or something oh, like that. It was really cute. Yeah. He's been the best dad to her. He's constantly like pushing me to be better, do mm-hmm. better, giving me, like, taking over responsibilities so I have more room to grow and take on more things that's and perfect the partner that's going to push you to be the best mm-hmm. version of yourself like i experience more personal growth um with myself in the first year that we were together than i had collectively the entire time from when i left up until that point wow. that, like that's i Crazy. So he's yeah. very good for your mental health then too. I, I, well, I mean, he tests that sometimes. He tests that sometimes. They always know how to push um, those buttons. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it's just a guy thing. I think they enjoy it. <laughs> they see um, where the line is, and then they just push just, it a little yeah, more. Yeah, just a little bit. So yes. the small so, one is your mom. Yep. Yeah. And then the big one is my dad's. Um, 
And uh, so since I was the oldest, I had like the most time with them before polygamy and yeah. remember the most with them. And they're still, what's funny is they're like best friends still. Like they talk yeah. for like hours at a time. Sometimes <laughs> it's so funny. But uh, uh, I told them, I was like, I remember the most of the good times. Like yeah. I want something to be able to like pass down to my kids because I'm the only one that's going to be having kids. Like, oh, that's true. So, the posterity's uh, coming through you. <laughs> yeah, I was like, so I want something that I can pass down to them from, like, my parents. Mm -hmm. And so, um, my dad gave me his ring for my wedding. And is it inscripted? It, yeah. What so it says, it? love mom and dad. And then my mom's obviously Aww. is too thin. But um, so she cute. had um, a band that was, like, three bands interlocking. So me and my sisters both have one each. Aww, so that's cute. And then got my dad's so. wow so i'm glad that you still have you still have like somewhat of a relationship with your mom and you have a decent relationship with your dad yeah i probably have a better relationship with my dad no like because obviously he's left and mm -hmm. um we have a lot more in common um mm -hmm. my mom's it, it's definitely strange because of the religious differences yeah, um totally get that. so all right, so this is a long video, but if you guys have any questions for Leah, leave them in the comments down below. You can also go follow her. She has a YouTube. She has an Instagram. I think I'll leave, leave the Twitter in there as well. But I think you have videos, too, on polygamy. We did a video yes. on her channel. Yes, we did. About the differences between our groups. Mm -hmm. And then I think you also have a video with your dad, right? Yes, I do have a video with my dad. So, so I you think can learn a little bit more about his backstory and why he kind of joined polygamy and then why he chose to leave and kind of what he's been up to since. So oh, that's interesting. I think I'll leave the links to those videos in my description yeah. box down below. But yeah, any questions, I'll try to answer. Maybe Lee will try to answer. Or maybe we'll even do another video again. Yeah, maybe we'll Whatever. go live. Yeah, that's true. It's so <laughs> scary going live, but I love it. But all right, thank you guys for watching and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. Bye. Bye.